afternoon. Good afternoon. There are a few teachers in the, in the, in the house. I could flash the lights, but we'll just we'll tap instead. I think everybody's been served. I hope so. Let's get started. My name is Rich Terrapak, and I'm chair of the Metropolitan Club Board of Trustees. And as always, it's my pleasure to welcome another big crowd here today. We've been packed the last three weeks. Uh, in case you haven't done so, uh, please turn your phones or PDAs or whatever to a mode where you can still tweet responsibly, but we won't hear anything. <laughs> so uh, you can, uh, our hashtag, by the way, is CMC Forum, and you can follow a CMC at CBUS Metro Club. Uh, this is also in your, in your forum program, so you can see all that information there. Um, while you're finishing your lunch, and if you have to adjust your chairs, feel free to do that. Uh, I'll remind you about next week's forum, which uh, is Swaco, Turning Trash into Cash. The discussion will focus on the plans of Team Gemini to build a recycling business adjacent to the landfill and also develop a green industrial park on land leased to them by Swaco. Uh, it will be an interesting story, uh, so make your reservations early because uh, we may fill up again. Uh, please note the upcoming other forum topics on the, in the flyers on your seats, but um, we also invite you to go to the website. You can check out all the upcoming events there. Uh, I'd like to invite all those who are uh, guests to uh, become one of our members. We have over 900 members at the Met in the Metropolitan Club, and we're aiming for 1,000 this year. Uh, we'll ring a bell or put up a chart or something when that happens. Uh, as a member, you receive uh, discounts on the weekly forums and other tangible benefits, but also the intangible benefit of getting to meet a, a lot of nice people and doing some networking. In the forum flyer, there's a list of everyone who is attending today. Uh, there's a list of guests and a list of members. We'd love to have the guests become members. You can do that by uh, contacting one of the staffers out in the lobby after the program. Uh, we'll sign you up. It's always a pleasure to welcome uh, new members, and today we have we'll have a new member. If he's here, please stand so we can recognize you and welcome you. Dustin Piles of Ohio STEM. Dustin, are you here? Yeah, there he is. <laughs> On the back of your uh, program, uh, of your forum program, there are about 80 companies and organizations, and these are the folks who sponsor our programs and make membership and the lunches a little more affordable. We appreciate uh, any leads if any of your organizations might be interested in, in seeing 250 to 300 people uh, in front of you, uh, sponsored by you in a week. Please let us know, we appreciate the leads. Uh, for today's forum, we wanna thank our sponsor, State Auto, and it, it is represented by its chairman, CEO Bob Restrepo and his associates. Uh, please thank them all for their support and welcome Bob to the stage. Thank you, Rich, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, sponsor what I think is going to be a terrific forum and a forum uh, that uh, really addresses a very, very important issue, both nationally but more importantly uh, here in the, in the Columbus community. Uh, education, urban education in particular, is a, uh, a big public policy challenge, uh, but one that we think at State Auto that uh, Columbus is peculiarly well positioned uh, to address. It's very important to our company. Uh, our business is all about people, as are most businesses, uh, preserving and enhancing a culture, recruiting and developing and training people that really align well with the behaviors and uh, outcomes that you expect of individuals is critical. And just recruiting good people isn't good enough. You have to be able to train and develop them. So education is important internally. We've invested in uh, something we call State Auto University. We've become increasingly active in uh, mentoring, recruiting people from the, uh, from the uh, community, and also one of our four top priorities in our, with our foundation is to support uh, educational initiatives, particularly as they uh, facilitate uh, diversity. But we're also in an industry and in insurance that's very involved in public policy issues. We were talking at the table in our business, good public policy is good business policy uh, uh, for state auto and the insurance industry in general. And here in Ohio, and we'll learn more about it when the governor makes his announcements over the next couple of uh, days, uh, education is our number one priority. 
along with workforce development. And uh, from my perspective and from our perspective at State Auto and the Columbus Partnership and some other organizations, certainly the Chamber, um, workforce development and education are inextricably bound together. You can't have one without the other. And uh, if you've got a primarily a workforce development uh, uh, hat on your head, if you ignore education, you ignore it at, at your peril. So for me, there's no better place to really address these issues than here in Columbus. We have our own parochial interests uh, for doing so. About almost 50 percent of our employees are here in central Ohio, most of them in, in Columbus. So what happens from an education and workforce development uh, uh, perspective has a disproportionate uh, benefit or threat if it's not working on our company. Um, but beyond that, uh, I can't think of a, I'm relatively new to Columbus, I can't think of a better community uh, in the country to address the issues of urban uh, education. Um, Columbus is a community that's collaborative, it's smart, it's very accessible. I've learned that in the five years that I've been here in Columbus. And those are the kind of characteristics that you need to address uh, what I think is probably one of our biggest, if not our single greatest challenge in this country, and that's uh, uh, reinforcing and improving our urban education system. So we've got a terrific panel uh, today to address those issues, and I'd like to introduce them. Our uh, moderator is the Executive Dean of Academics and Administration for the Graham Family of Schools. Please welcome Greg Brown. Greg is at the forum. Our, uh, as we file in here, uh, next to me right here, our first panelist is the President and Executive Director of KidsOhio.org. Please welcome Mark, Mark Reel. <laughs> next up there in the middle is uh, the Executive Director of KIPP Central Ohio. Please welcome Hannah Powell Tooney. Our final panelist is the principal at Eastmore Academy, a high school uh, here in the Columbus City School District. Uh, please welcome Elisa Gillison. <laughs> and on behalf of the Columbus Metropolitan Club and State Auto, and we're very, very pleased and privileged uh, to be able to sponsor this forum, please welcome all our panelists. And Greg, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being here today and for your interest in this topic. Also, thanks to CMC and to State Auto for uh, sponsoring this important discourse. Um, we're grateful for the opportunity today to focus on our children and their education challenges and hope. This is an exciting time to work in education. Merging technologies, including a greater understanding of how our brains function, help us know how children learn. Also, there's great interest in the work of schools, locally, nationally, internationally, from businesses, think tanks, authors, mayors, governors, presidents, all have focus on education as a major priority with billions of dollars devoted to it. It's also a challenging time with the need for children to learn well and to learn how to learn well, never being more urgent. In the knowledge economy, if you fall behind in school, you may fall into an occupational and economic abyss. This is especially true for children growing up in poverty who lack the family financial supports that can buoy people when they flounder. So improving educational outcomes for all children just may be the financial and ethical imperative of our time. There's a highly personal impact of school and education as well. A unique and defining characteristic of our humanity is our ability to learn and our desire to learn and to do so over a lifetime. With this unique and defining characteristic in mind, those of us in the education world find ourselves with a special responsibility and honor. We take our responsibilities to heart, of course, and to mind. There are many examples of schools and classrooms in our community to, that do this well. And I want to say at the outset of this that all children today are growing up in a world that presents challenges, dangers, 
and hopes, not just children in one neighborhood or another, but all. That said, there are indeed special challenges and opportunities for children growing up in a city. Today we want to share with you a glimpse of what a few of us are doing on a daily basis to help young people succeed in school and in their lives, along with sharing the challenges these children face. We also want to continue to stir this pot of great interest so that as a community we continue to examine how to make this important work the best it can be. Then we're going to open up to questions as CMC always does, so we'll look forward to that dialogue and there's a little place in your program where you can jot down your questions if you think of one and then are afraid you're going to forget it later. Mark, through his leadership of Kids Ohio, provides an incredible resource about the state of education in Central Ohio, what matters to children, families, the wider community regarding learning, what success looks like, and what challenges children and our community face while working to create productive lives for everyone. Today, Mark will weave this perspective around the stories of schooling you'll hear. Alicia, Hannah, and I represent different ways that schooling organizations can be structured. Alicia in a traditional district, Columbus, Hannah with a national charter organization, KIPP, that has a local footprint, and me with what's known in the charter world as a mom and pop, Graham family of schools. I'm pop, by the way. <laughs> um, mom, my colleague Eileen Mears is here with us today as well. Also, the three of us have a slightly different focus in our school's educational program, and you'll hear about these from each of us. But all of us up here share a deep interest and belief that all students can grow in intelligence. That intelligence is not a fixed point children come to us with, and then we work around those gifts and deficits. We believe, rather, that what a child brings to us in terms of acquired knowledge and gaps in knowledge are the starting points for the design of their educational journeys in our schools. So let's start this first with a brief overview of our schools including the focus of each of our schools and who our students are, and, and mark your organization too, and then share one or two programs or aspects of our school that you share with families when you're recruiting them to attend the school. Why would they want to go there? Um, Alicia, why don't we start with you? Well, thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Starting with Eastmore Academy, Eastmore Academy High School is an urban school in Columbus City School District. And our focus is college and career readiness. That's the end result. Uh, we have three pillars that we focus on, and we are a lottery school where our focus is academics, art, and athletics. And we take those and we weave those for success for our young people. Uh, we also have a biomedical program that has been very successful, actually nationally accredited just recently, just as of last year. So those students that are interested in the math and sciences can attend Eastmore Academy to focus on that. But first and foremost, and going back to college and career readiness, when Greg had mentioned uh, when we don't live up to our responsibility as educators, then our students can fall into the economic abyss, if I could use your words. We all have a responsibility, and when we realize all of the kids come to school, everybody has a dream when they're young. And everyone in this room had a dream when they were young, and we would be lying if we said we didn't. It is our job to cultivate and bring out the best and make sure our students are prepared for the future. In a nutshell, that's our focus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm with KIPP. It stands for Knowledge is Power Program. KIPP is a national network of charter schools that exist in low-income communities to help kids get to college. Of the kids who have attended KIPP schools across the country, close to 90% have matriculated to college. Here locally, we have one middle school in the Linden area. Um, it serves kids in grade five, grades 5 through 8. We have plans on expanding to serve close to 2,000 kids by the end of this decade in grades K through 12. Close to 90% of our kids receive free and reduced lunch, which means that a family of four is making about $23,000 or less annually. About 90% of our students are minority. We go to school every day. Uh, we're open from eight to seven, so kids can get breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, snack, two snacks. Um, 
We also have free transportation. Um, we work, some of our kids are transported by Columbus City Schools, others are transported through another way, but that's a really important thing to our families. Our focus is college. Um, our kids, the, one of the first things that they know and learn as soon as they walk into our door or in that meeting that we have with them in the home is what year they're going to college. And we refer that number 2020, that's how we refer to our kids in the mm -hmm. fifth grade, that's the year they're going to college. So college access, um, helping our kids make it to and through is the foundation for, for what we do at KIPP. Thanks. Uh, Graham Family Schools. We have four schools, two high schools, the Graham School, which started in 2000, the public charter school. Uh, our sponsor is the Educational Service Center of Central Ohio um, for all of our schools. Uh, the Graham School is experiential education. Two days a week, students uh, spend their days in the community and service learning work with about 100 mentors around the, the city. Um, and then on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, take more traditional academic classes back at the school. Culminates in what we call walkabout, the second half of senior year, where students are full in full-time uh, internships, mentor, mentorships, um, mostly in Franklin County, but a lot out of the state and out of the country. One boy climbed up the base camp of Mount Everest a couple of years ago, and a girl in Bolivia uh, working with an orphanage in the mountains. So. Um, uh, six years ago, we started the Charles School at Ohio Dominican University. Uh, it, too, is a high school. It's an early college high school, one of three in uh, the, the city, uh, along with the Metro School and Afrocentric um, Columbus City School. Uh, and our students um, go to Ohio Dominican University starting in their junior year and can earn up to an associate's degree. There's 200 around the country. Um, I'll make a shameless uh, plug for our student conference that we're hosting, uh, but not right here. Um, that'll be later, so look for the shameless plug. Um, then we have a middle school, Graham Expeditionary Middle School. Uh, oh, by the way, our, our um, uh, Graham School is located in Clintonville, and um, the uh, Charles School is in the Brent Nell Building, which is a Columbus school that we lease uh, on the back end of Ohio Dominican. Uh, our middle school and elementary school are uh, located at the former Indianola Elementary School building, which is also a Columbus City School building that we lease across the street from Ohio State. And uh, we are members with the uh, Expeditionary Learning Organization. Uh, and all that we do in our work is uh, focused around experiential education. So we're guiding students through experiences in the community uh, and then helping them reflect on that. And that's, the, that's really the essence of our work. Um, Mark? Uh, KidsOhio.org is a 10-year-old nonpartisan education research and policy organization. Two of our board members, Barbara Truman and, and Jeff Little, are here today. And we exist to try to provide accurate information about education trends and to work with the leaders that you see here today. Okay, well, let's continue on with you, Mark. What are you learning about Columbus from all the studies that you do about what it is parents wanna, want in a school? So we have, done, we have done a number of analyses about what parents look for and, and the, the Columbus District worked closely with us to fashion the questions. And when we ask questions both of, of, of parents in the district and of parents who had left the district for charter schools, they wanted the same three things. They wanted the schools to be safe, they wanted their child to get personal attention, and they were concerned, for example, if discipline was weak in the classroom and the teacher had to spend all of her time with one student and couldn't spend time with their student, that was a matter of concern. And communication. People are very eager to have their emails and telephone calls returned. When they don't, they choose other options. So we found that, 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 uh, that uh, the families wanted the same regardless of whether it was a district school or a charter school. They wanted the same kind of public school education. You produced recently a, a document, um, the State of Education for Columbus Preschool to College. Um, is there anything in that that, and I think some of the synopsis was at the table, uh, anything in that that you should highlight? Yeah, the, the mayor, I think all of you know that Mayor Michael Coleman and City Council President and Andrew Ginther have stepped forward to, to help improve education in, in, in Columbus. And there's a one-page summary of what we were asked to present to them in October. And a couple of the highlights that, that may be of interest to you. If you look, the city of Columbus, as all of you know, is larger than the Columbus School District. Mm -hmm. and, and when you look at the parts of the city of Columbus that are growing, the parts of the city that are served by suburban, uh, 
school districts are growing, grew 22% in the last decade. The parts of the city that were served by the Columbus School District grew by 5%. I think one of the things that the mayor and city council want to do, help close that gap. Same thing when you look at births in the city. We've actually had a decline in births in some inner city neighborhoods. But if you look at, if you look at outer belt neighborhoods like around Easton, there's a 30% increase in births. And so I think the mayor and council are interested in making sure that all parts of the city can, can experience growth. We also pointed out, we, we pointed out that the students today face s some challenges and opportunities. There's more poverty, for example. If you look statewide, 45% of public school students are eligible for a free reduced price lunch. That's up from 35% five years ago. And in Columbus, it's over 80%. And what may surprise you is that in 11 of the suburban school districts, the poverty rate is over 20%. So these are shared opportunities. These are, these are shared challenges. Uh, it, it, diversity is growing. Uh, the suburb, suburban communities are much more diverse. <clears throat> and in fact, we've almost reached a tipping point because almost half of the children of color in the county are attending a suburban school system. So we have shared issues and shared challenges. And I think that's... That's one of the, the, the things. And then just a couple other things. Franklin County is a leader statewide in children who are need help learning English. And one of the reasons this is a good thing for our community because people are moving here from other countries because there are employment opportunities. They're not, for the most part, moving to Youngstown because there's a lack of employment opportunities. So while it is a challenge, a short-term challenge for our schools, many schools will tell you these are youngsters who are highly motivated, uh, they're well behaved and they enrich our school our, our schools and, and then <clears throat> so these are these are some of the things that that uh, that the mayor and the mayor's commission are looking at as they as they begin uh, their work uh, okay so Hannah Alicia Greg um, let's talk about our schools and the challenges academic and otherwise that we see students bring through our door a and then B what we're doing to help address that, and, you know, either in the short term or the long term, Hannah? Yeah, sure. I mean, are there challenges? Yes. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of them, but I'd be regretful to go right into the challenges without just sharing how many opportunities there are um, and how inspired I am, my team, we are, on a daily basis about what's possible. Our kids, our kids are some of the most thoughtful, creative, hopeful, resilient, kind, young people, people in general that I've ever had the opportunity to meet. Um, and they're craving a caring, structured, and nurturing environment where they can, as Alicia said, be their absolute best. What other challenges? Yeah, there's a lot of them. 100% um, <laughs> of our kids, nearly 100% of our kids, for the fifth year in a row, entered fifth grade, not reading on grade level. What's the impact of our program? That looks like a kid coming to KIPP and they're not able to read basic sentences. They're not able to sometimes identify all of their letters. But by the power of the program, by the seventh grade, and I was driving a kid to a basketball game two weeks ago, he's talking to me now about Of Mice and Men that he's reading and The Outsiders and Animal Farm in the seventh grade. So literacy, you know, and where our kids are entering, it's a huge challenge. What do we do to address that? I mean, there's a ton, but data to drive instruction, rigorous and aligned curriculum, we differentiate, we use technology to do so. Um, we have great teachers and people and caring individuals, parents, community members, others. I see a lot of community partners in here, whether it's Boys and Girls Club or COSI or ROCKS or um, you know, Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. And so I could keep going and keep going, but we have people who really help us address that. Additionally, you know, one in 10 low-income kids right now are making it to and through college, one in 10. And we do something with our kids every year where 10 of them stand up and they all say, I wanna go to college. And then nine of them sit down and one is left. It's not okay, right? It's not okay, that's a challenge. So we need to be real about the challenges and how we're going to be proactive every day in attacking that. But beyond the academic, and uh, sorry, with the kids you know, making it to and through college, we do a lot of work with our kids and our families through a KIPP through college program where we work to place kids in quality high schools across the city. We have kids at both of your schools, Eastmore and Charles. Mm -hmm. um, and our kids earned about a million dollars in scholarships to attend some of the best schools here in the city last year. I was just at CSG this morning where one of our alumna is attending on a full ride. 
So we work with our families to help them understand choice. But beyond the academic challenges that I've referenced, right, another statistic that I just throw out there that I use often is that by the time low-income kids in our country reach the fourth grade, they are already two to three grade levels behind their middle class peers. So when we get beyond the academic challenges, I mean, I pose it as a question when thinking about the challenges that our kids have. Did you have access to three meals yesterday? If my kids weren't at KIPP, many of them wouldn't have had access to that. Did you sleep in a comfortable bed last night? Many of my kids didn't. Do you know a family member or a friend who has been the victim of gun violence or some other ceaseless and senseless act, sorry, senseless act of violence? My kids do. And so we work to help ensure that we're providing them, again, a safe and structured and nurturing environment as possible, relying on organizations in our city like Directions for Youth and Family Services, Nationwide, the Buckeye Ranch, the Ohio State School of Social Work, to help us address those non-academic barriers that our kids are coming to us with. We have an opportunity to address them in proactive ways. And lastly, what we do to address the challenges is we recruit, retain, and support highly motivated leaders, teachers, and staff members to do right by kids and deliver on the promise that they deserve a quality education. All kids can, will, can and will learn every single day. Great, Ms. Chip? I think Hannah said it very well. The social economic challenges are real and they have a direct correlation to academic deficiencies. And then you think about uh, the statistics on this sheet, 35% of kindergartners need intervention. And we talk about, in a lot of our students, their first generation going to college. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about parents who don't know how to navigate those avenues yeah. going to college. When I hear challenges, I think of a young lady who was homeless most of her high school years. And we believe in building relationships with our young people. We didn't know where the young lady was going to sleep when she left but she built relationships with our staff members. And one staff member asked her to make him a promise that she was going to graduate from high school. This young lady found her voice because she felt comfortable. Not only did she find her voice, she won Poetry Out Loud. She won the National, National, the National Elks Oratorical Contest and she earned a scholarship, wow. full scholarship. She's at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, the main campus. And those stories are young people who are overcoming challenges. So we know that they're coming with challenges, but we have to be ready to meet the young people. Mm -hmm. There is a young lady who just received a scholarship from Atlas Butler Community Service, and, which is another one of our pillars. And I had a conversation with her, and I said, you have enough on your plate with school, and you're working with the play. How do you find time to do the community service? Verbatim. Mrs. Gillison, I come from a family that has little, and it makes me feel important when I can give back. I feel like I am special. She is now in a pool of students all over the nation to win a $20,000 scholarship. <clears throat> challenges are real. We can overcome those challenges because if we can't, we don't need to be sitting up here. And we need to let the students know that we can overcome those challenges. Our focus is college. I invite all of you, please visit Eastmore Academy. We have two eight by four college boards. They're boards and every time a student is accepted to college, we put their picture on the board with the college they're accepted to. And there are some students, you'll see them up there five and six times. And in the beginning, the teachers didn't get it. They said, well, why do you have all five of hers up there? Because every time is a stroke of confidence for those students. But I put them in the hallway, we display them. Our ninth graders come through and I'm like, okay, time to get to class, let's go, let's move it. And they're staring because this is the young lady I eat lunch with. This is the young man on the basketball team. I can do this, I can do this. 
So every October, the last Saturday in October, and we do it in concert with I Know I Can Foundation, we have a college application workshop. Our students come in and the parents come in. There is a finan financial aid section for the parents and the students complete five college applications. English teachers are there to proofread their essays. It is a one-stop shop. By the time they leave, we mail them for them. We get the transcripts for them. And my fingers are sore because I am writing recommendation letters left and right, all of the administrators. But by the time that parent and that student walk out, we've held their hand through the process. And now they wait. And these college applications are coming in. As I left school today, I looked at the college board. We also have a thermometer. We have, right now, as of today, you can mark this down, <laughs> over 2.5 million wow. in scholarship monies. Our wow. young people are getting it done. Um, I'm going to talk about two challenges. One, for our five-year-olds. We have uh, some of our five-year-olds come to school knowing how to mm -hmm. read and some of our five-year-olds come to school not knowing what their colors are. And so that gap uh, is exacerbated by fourth grade without an intervention, as has been mentioned, uh, to the point where students can fall behind uh, and never catch up unless there is a significant intervention. So how we uh, connect um, all of these kids to, to growing in their learning because we want the one who comes to us knowing how to read to be advancing in his or her learning just like we want the one who doesn't know his or her colors to, to learn the colors mm -hmm. and then to start learning how to read and that the, the, uh, having the kids uh, learn to be in the same classroom is a great challenge for our teachers. Mm -hmm. And then you guys hit on, on this uh, similar thing that we face. All of the all the issues that our students bring, that many of our students bring to school, and they come from homes that are in, in areas uh, where they live that are chaotic, and uh, sometimes from loving parents, and sometimes not, but they live in some chaos. And when they come to school, they have switched that off because now they're in a new normal. Mm -hmm. and. All of us work very hard to build a school culture that's supportive and that, that addresses the needs of every one of our children, but it's gotta be a safe environment. And some of the chaos that you have at home, it, it can't be here. And so that adjustment um, is, is a great challenge for all of our schools as we uh, create this new normal for kids to observe. I'm always struck by how resilient um, most of our kids are and don't get thrown off their, their moorings just because one or two or three kids act out. But I also just, my heart goes out to people for these transitions between school and home. And there is a great challenge for all of us as a community because when they go from school and back home, many of these kids are transitioning into this other life that is, is very different. And so how they make that transition around other kids is you know, is, is a real significant challenge. We deal with this through our advisories and, um, and our, our counselors, and, and it's just an ongoing challenge. And then, of course, we have tons of community resources. Many of you sitting here today are the you know, biggest supporters of our work, and, and our kids wouldn't survive without it. Um, Mark, nationally, um, what is it? You know, you've, you've had your ear to the ground both locally and nationally, and um, there are a lot of uh, studies that we've heard about some of them here at the uh, Metropolitan Club uh, that indicate what, you know, what great schools are and what great schools, you know, what are the things that seem to be present in, in all of these entities? Well, I, I want to, I brought with me two books which I'd strongly recommend that you read, and they're both very hopeful and they're not technical. One is The One World Schoolhouse written by Salman Khan, and I think most of you know that he has developed this very extensive library of online resources. So if you want to do mathematical computations, you want to learn about French history, and the way students and teachers are using this is students actually watch those videos, come to class, get their questions answered, do work with their teacher. So it's not replacing the teacher. The teacher is actually more important. But I think this is, we're going to see, have a lot more access to e-learning. I'd encourage you to read this book. 
And then Greg's going to talk about this in a minute, but this is another book called How Children Succeed by Paul Tuff, and it's Grit, Curiosity, and the Hidden Power of Character, which all three of our other panelists have been talking about. But these are books that uh, policymakers across the country are reading and, and, and trying to, to figure out what are the lessons we, we can learn from them. And I think nationally, a couple things, and, and this Columbus is, is unique in a positive way. Education can be a very bitter, divisive debate in many communities, and that's not the case in Columbus. Uh, just recently, for example, we saw our school board join with our mayor to call for a third-party management review of the district. That's commendable. In some communities, they're still arguing about that. We have an educational service center that helps share services for 25 uh, school districts and a number of charter schools so that schools can save money on operations. That's not going on in a lot of places. In a lot of places, you would not see a district school on the same platform with charter schools. That's going on in Columbus. And, and in many communities, and, and this is here, there are people here today from the Columbus Chamber of Commerce and the Columbus Partnership. They are strong leaders in terms of, of, of improving schools. So we start with, with a number of strengths that, that, that other communities do not have. And I think, I think what we're united in, and this would include uh, places like Columbus State Community College, the library system in Columbus is, is a real player here. Is, is making sure that the children who come to the schools that, we're, that, we, that are described here get the kind of community support that they need so the schools can do their job. Thanks. Uh, just want to give you this warning shot. About five minutes, we're going to uh, open up for questions. So, um, you know, I, I know there's going to be just a rush to the mic. So <laughs> you may want to... Don't um, injure yourself. You know, start getting in line right now if you do so you don't get trampled. But... Um, uh, so, be thinking, you know, about that. We will look forward to that. Um, meantime, um, yeah, Mark, you mentioned the Paul Tuff book, and he, um, he writes in there that, um, that one of the things that makes a child most successful is an inclination, he writes, to persist at a boring and often reward, unrewarding task, the ability to delay gratification, and the tendency to follow through on a plan. Um, and he goes on to say these are the same traits that cause a person to be successful in work and college. Uh, that has to be coupled with curiosity. Mm -hmm. So, um, ladies, we're not trying to make school boring, um, but, you know, we're fighting against this cultural... Uh, more of instant gratification and you know changing and and we're you know this is a big challenge it seems that uh, and I'm just wondering you know how how you guys how we all deal with persistence sure so character and academics are key to a college prep education um, Kip is featured in this book the one of the founders we're all about Martin Seligman's work in positive psychology and learned optimism. And, you know, we do believe, I do believe, that we need to teach our students, our kids, um, explicit ways on, and purposeful ways on how to be resilient and to persevere and to have self-control. So we explicitly help our kids think about their thinking with what does it mean to bounce back from losing. We create conditions for them to to fail, you know, it's okay to try something and have it not work out and then think about that and, and get, get yourself back up and, and keep going. Um, slow down during a test, uh, examine your impulses, to wanna rush through something is an explicit way of teaching, you know, how to persevere and, and create this sort of resilience. Um, and making learning fun, I mean, when you come in our building, there's a ton, I mean, there's chanting, there's snapping, there's clapping, there's kids. All over the all over the place. Um, we have when you many of you have been some of you I guess have been to our school, um, but there's an open area where there's College Corner and kids are you know sitting on bright orange couches, um, exploring Animal Farm like I had talked about, right? So we just the very nature of who we are is that we want this to be a place where our kids come, again safe, structured. They're encouraged. They can fail. They can try new things. We um, expose them to a lot of opportunities, whether that's trips outside of our school, field lessons, to just see something different. You know, what it feels like to ride on a boat or what it feels like to order a sunny side egg 
you know, at a restaurant and what that means or how to order your, your meat um, or to figure out that you really like robotics because you connected with an engineer at Ohio State. So just, you know, infusing our curriculum with a lot of different opportunities for different types of learning and the tagline for our school is find your passion, inspire, own your journey. And so just ensuring that our kids have multiple opportunities to figure out what they're passionate about, own it, and do something with it. And we, you know, encourage them in that, in that process. Mm -hmm. Key word is resilient. Our young people are so very, very resilient. When you think about the challenges they are facing every day, some of those, cha those challenges we haven't faced, but they face them. Greg, you talked about the new normal. When their home life isn't what we would expect for it to be or hope for it to be, but then they can come to school and school is a whole nother life. So they can turn that off, turn this on, we have to keep our young people motivated, and we do that in a myriad of ways. Uh, we have post-secondary education options um, throughout Columbus City Schools. We also, our impact team is one of the largest organizations in the school, larger than the choir, larger than drama, and it's about giving back to the community. I wanna go back to Jillian Baptiste, who said, I feel important when I give back. Not I feel important when I answer a question right in the classroom. So it's finding what makes them feel important and what makes them feel needed. Mm -hmm. Curiosity and not being boring. Our foreign language department last year took a group of students and we are talking about students from a high poverty, high achieving school. They went to Paris and Madrid. A young man named Melvin, very shy, can't even look you in the eye. He had to get on the railway, and part of the assignment was you had to strike up a conversation with someone, and you had to do it in that language. And he did it, and of course his friends were videotaping on their cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> Funniest thing you ever seen, but that gave Melvin such confidence. Then he came back, he was like, oh, can I present at the staff meeting? And just little things like that. He never would have had that opportunity to go to Paris. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying Paris and Madrid. Another young lady, um, she was a Gates Millennium Scholar. Poverty like I have not seen in Ohio. And I am from Talladega, Alabama. You probably, Talladega 500 Raceway. But this young lady didn't have a doorknob on their front door. The orifice where the doorknob should be, there was a rag stuffed in it. Mattresses on the floor. She was a Gates Millennium Scholar. She graduates May 15th of this year. She was recently home and we talked, she has been to 13 countries. She wants to be an educator because educators made a difference in her life. She's been to China, Beijing, Shanghai, Costa Rica, Ecuador, and I'm sitting there having lunch with her at California Pizza and I'm, this is the same young lady that I took home that day that didn't have a doorknob. So it's things like this, and you talk about curiosity, our kids have to get out. We work, um, their senior year, there's an internship component. And every Thursday, our students are out on internships, and they're at uh, DES, what is it? DSCC, thank you very much, sir. Nationwide, um, The Ohio State University, but they're out. Curiosity, you have to show them what's out there because many of them, they have no clue. If you were to ask this young lady that has been to 13 countries when she was in high school, if she could phantom that, I don't know what her answer would have been. But I remember, and you talk about resilience, to qualify for the scholarship, you have to write maybe eight essays. She had written all of the essays she had them on the jump drive, so she's going down the hall with her laptop, and her jump drive is in her laptop. So she's coming to my office for me to proofread them. By the time she gets to my office, I've got to finish, Ms. Gilson, can you proof it? Certainly, sweetheart, sit down. She looked, her jump drive had broke off. She had lost the data. She had lost everything. She started crying. I said, Lorraine, who wrote those essays? She said, I wrote them. I said, okay, I'm gonna sit your tail down and write them again. <laughs> so she sat down, she rewrote them. She, what, she did win the Gates Millennium Scholarship that will pay for her bachelor's, her master's, 
and her doctorate degree. Awesome story. Um, and ditto on all uh, that from, from our end. Um, we also believe in multiple drafts. It's a, it's a uh, hallmark of the expeditionary learning uh, schools. And because teenagers love to turn something in and say, that's it. And we say, that's good for a first draft. Now let's work on the second, third, and fourth. And I think when you build in that kind of appreciation for, um, you know, that your work isn't finished quite yet that uh, it, it helps to build in persistence. So, thank you. Uh, as promised, we will take questions from the audience. CMC records all of its forums for broadcast on YouTube streaming and streaming on CMC's website and the Columbus Metropolitan website. Well, at the microphone, please introduce yourself. We thank you in advance for not making long editorial comments. Um, let's take our first question. Marie? Hi. Hey. I'm Marie Trudeau. I'm with the W.E. Davis Insurance, a proud state auto agent, by the way. Um, and I also have bragged that my son was in the first Eastmore Academy graduating class. Yay! Yay. Glad to see you're growing since then. Um, I volunteer at an inner city school, Stewart, and I'm overwhelmed by the needs there. And, and I, I wish I had more than an hour a week to be there. I mean, some of the kids just need nurturing. It's not even so much academic, it's just nurturing. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm saying that just to say how much I admire the teaching staff. Uh, they fascinate me. And my question has to do with what's been in the news so much lately is how safe we are, how safe the kids are in the schools. And you talk about the, the different environment from home to school, and now the school is not so safe anymore. Um, do you have any ideas on that? Do you want armed guards in your buildings? Or do you have other ideas on where we can go as a country to have our kids safe when they're in the build school buildings? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Um, not only do we want our schools safe, we want our communities safe. But when you think about a place where your kids are, uh, at Eastmore Academy and all of the high schools in Columbus City Schools, we have a Columbus police officer in the building who is carrying, uh, who has a weapon, who protects us, helps keep us safe. But it's those good habits of mind that you have to instill in the kids. And then we do our drills. Uh, we have lockdowns, level one, two, and three, and our kids know how serious these lockdown drills are. So we communicate with parents so that parents know um, safety is the number one issue for our children, for our staff, so we are working on that. And like I said, we have the police officers in the building, uh, and we also have a safety and security officer in the building. But our kids are very cognizant of the dangers that are outside, and I think we do a pretty good job in keeping our kids safe and sound when they're inside of our buildings. Hi, my name is Leslie Vasquez. I'm an undergraduate student at the John Glenn School of Public Affairs at OSU. Um, very interested in education and underprivileged children have touched around it a lot and it breaks my heart and I just want to encourage people that are here we need people mentoring in the schools you know businesses need to give their employees the opportunity on a weekly basis to take an hour of their time and contribute to the community you know, that's one suggestion. There, there, there are organizations out there like Kids Hope that that has a religious affiliation, um, but you know, where they have people in the schools mentoring the kids, they go through background checks. I mean, there are ways to do this, and I just hope that people start stepping up to do it. I'm, I'm really pleased with our leadership. Um, you know, Steve Vota, Learn for Life, the survey that was done, I mean, we need this data, but we also, we don't have to wait for all the answers to get involved. So I just encourage all of you to think about it. Thank Thanks, you. Leslie. Thank we, you, Leslie. We have, uh, at the Graham School, a hundred partners, community partners, where our students mm -hmm. are working with them and uh, have been since we opened. And it makes a huge difference mm -hmm. to the lives of the teens but we also know it makes a huge difference to the people who are working with them. 
Uh, and so that is, is just key. At our middle school and elementary school, which are across from John Glenn, in fact, we have had them over there, um, we had 150 volunteers in our school last year working with us. A lot of college students were an adopt-a-school partner with them, but it enriches all that we do, so ditto. And I would like to add, uh, if you are interested in being a mentor, starting with Big Brothers and Big Sisters, they have a program called Project Mentor, and they pair you up with a sixth grade student, and you stay with that sixth grade student throughout their graduation. So you have that time to build those relationships with that young person. Jim. Hi, I'm Jim Coe from WCBE <coughs> Public Radio, which is um, the radio service of Columbus City Schools, as well as a charter member of National Public Radio. Um, I want to thank you for telling us of some of your, your challenges in, in your mission, but more importantly, I want to thank you for the success stories that you have shared with us, uh, showing us that there is hope and there's still work to do. I'd like to remind you that WCBE serves as an intern site, and we've had many fine uh, high school students from Columbus City Schools, specifically from Eastmore Academy. Yay! And also <laughs> from the Graham School, where I don't know if we were the walkabout or if we kind of prepared them for their walkabout. <laughs> but keep in mind that we're, um, we, uh, we love having the interns. Uh, it's a good experience, a real life experience for them. And we don't have them making coffee. They're doing something. In some cases, yeah. they're actually uh, writing and reading uh, broadcasts on air. Right. And in at least one case, we've actually uh, put one of those former Columbus City School student interns on our payroll, and she's our full-time employee now. Oh, great. Thank, so you. thank you. Thank you. Uh, my shameless plug about the Charles Schools uh, Student Conference in April, we're hosting the uh, national uh, student conference for our early college high school organization. Kids from all over the country, April 13th through 16th, on the theme, What Makes for a Healthy Community? And uh, there are four pillars that they're investigating, and so we're working with community partners uh, right now throughout to help them in that experiential day. And the uh, final uh, event is going to be held at COSI uh, on April 16th, so we appreciate COSI. Of course, who doesn't? Hi, good afternoon. My name is Brenda Fields. I'm the Education Program Supervisor for the Capital Kids After School Enrichment Program, and I am passionate about education. I am passionate. I work with kids K through five. What I wanted to say is that I honor you all who are working in the schools because that is our partners, but also one of the challenges that I have found is at the end of the day, the teachers are, well, the schools are your counselors, you're the mentors, you're the fathers, you're the mothers, you're the disciplinarians. Oh, yeah, you do teach also to make right, sure they do right, those right, things. Right. But one of the challenges that I found at the end of the day is that you need parent involvement. Mm -hmm. Because across the board, socioeconomically, you have to have parent involved because that what matters to their kids. My question is, how do you get the parents involved? Because that's what's going to make the biggest difference. And believe me, you can tell a child whose parent is involved in their life and a child whose parents who's not involved in their life. And so my goal is, as I work with the kindergarten, that grade, elementary schools, is how do we get the parents involved and convince them you are the one that's going to make a difference in your child's life, so how do you do that? Yeah, um, so absolutely, parent involvement is key, family involvement is key, and community involvement is key. For us at KIPP, it starts at the home, so we do a home visit with every student. Um, if it's not comfortable in the home, we'll do that at our school where we go over what's called a commitment to excellence where we're able to share with them what we promise to do, what we expect of their child, and what our expectations are of them as well, and how this is gonna be a partnership from, from the minute go. Um, we have a lot of community events at our school in the evenings, and try to not only just do them in the evenings, but on the weekends, so that it's fit, fitting to our family schedules, right? So that we're not just having things during the school day, or only at night, or only on the weekends, but really being mindful of, of how busy our parents' lives are. We proactively reach out to them if your child doesn't do their homework. You get a phone call that night. We call every time our, if your child isn't here, we want to know why. Mm -hmm. So just a lot of proactive communication and making school a place where they want, where they want to come, mm -hmm. where they feel respected, where they feel encouraged, and where they, where they feel like their ideas and their values you know, matter. So it looks like a lot of different ways, but really proactively reaching out and ensuring that those relationships that are built over time happen.
And I'd, I'd add to that, um, at Eastmore Academy, parents are a part of our school community. So we involve parents in everything that we do. And it's important to remember that sometimes if parents don't show up, it's not because they're not interested. That's right. Some of our parents have two jobs. Some of our parents have three jobs. How do you keep that communication going? Mm -hmm. We do a weekly voice dial, and it goes out every Saturday at 3 o'clock. And it is the weekly update. It lets parents know what's going on. Because that young person, when they come home, hey, what's going on this week in school? Nothing. You know, <laughs> once they get to high school, they stop talking and communicating with their parents. It's something that they go through. So we give the parents that weekly voice dialer, and they come to expect it at 3 o'clock, except for when Ohio State is playing. Then we push it back to 5. <laughs> but they come to expect it. Uh, we have a parent, uh, a parent workshop that we do, actually that's coming up February 23rd. And in that parent workshop, I move myself out and we have a parent panel. Our PTA parents talking with incoming ninth grader parents. I move myself out so that they, those parents feel comfortable asking the questions. You may not feel comfortable asking if the principal is standing in there with a notepad, but if I am not in the room, they are very comfortable asking those questions, and our PTA can be very transparent and answer those questions for them. Okay. Uh, we also have a, um, and I'm pretty proud of this, we have a parent choir. When our students uh, graduate, um, we have a baccalaureate ceremony pr prior to graduation at the Lincoln Theater, and the parents come in, and that voice dialer comes on the parent's cell phone, so the kids don't know about it. So the parents come to rehearsal and they come. They come to the rehearsal, we have three rehearsals. Then that night, when the curtains open and our young people look up and they see their parents up there and the parents are singing. And that right there goes a very long way because the parents, they feel like they are a part of the process and when you really think about it, they are. A lot of times graduation, that the ceremony, the pomp and circumstance is for the parents. So uh, we try to involve the parents as much as possible. In May, we're going to do a college declaration night. All of these kids who have all of these multiple college acceptance letters, they gotta choose one. And then we're gonna make a very big deal out of it. Then we go to Rice's Bakery, we get this big cake, all of the colleges represented on the cake, the parents invite grandparents, but we make it a part of the process so they feel very comfortable. And there's something about the voice dialer, you are going into homes every Saturday at three o'clock. They really feel like they know you and they really feel like they're a part of it. And our PTA is phenomenal. They work with us uh, in concert. They help with the, as a matter of fact, the parent, parent to parent panel, our PTA pretty much runs that. The college application workshop I spoke of before, our PTA, they come in, they provide the breakfast and they provide the lunch. They even sit down and they help proofread. Whatever it is we need, they help because they see the big picture. They feel comfortable. They feel like their students are in a safe environment and they feel like we communicate. Uh, transparency is the key. And a lot of times our parents can't be there, but when they can't be there, then we go to them. Well, you are competing with the president for sure on that Saturday message. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I think I speak for the whole crowd today that, that uh, it's, it's a feel-good moment to see and witness such uh, passion and real dedication from all of you. Um, and I say thank you. <laughs> I hope you all enjoyed today's forum. You can, you can, as we talked about earlier, you can see it on, on uh, YouTube. Uh, there's a link on the CMZ website. You can continue conversation uh, out in the lobby. Sign up for next week, Swaco, Turning Trash to Cash. But before you leave, let's thank our sponsor one more time, State Auto Insurance.